Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Swati Biswas from the Department of Islamic History and Culture, University of Calcutta. In this module, we are going to discuss pre-Mughal painting traditions in India. The pre-Mughal painting traditions, our objective is to discuss the very two of the painting traditions because Jain miniatures have been discussed in the earlier modules and we will not discuss Eastern Indian painting miniatures because during the medieval period this painting tradition went up to the eastern fringe of India and beyond that moved to Nepal. We will discuss essentially the secular folk and the religious style that developed in the 15th and the 16th century and a conglomerate group of painting styles that we call the Sultanate painting. For introducing this module, we have to understand that this section will try to look into the different indigenous scenario in the field of painting that flourished before the advent of the Mughals. The art of calligraphy was very important in Persia and it also gained a popularity in parts of India, especially in the north and also along the south. Calligraphy was popular because of the religious tenets were written in different languages and accumulated in manuscripts. The story of calligraphy and illustrations in India started in the hands of the Buddhist, moved on to the Jains, and then to some extent it also was popular among the Hindus. It then moved on to certain secular field as this gained popularity and the norms of book illustration of Iran somehow started influencing the whole of Asia and also especially India because of the trade relations that we have. The artists were very receptive to all the changes that were happening in the market or at least the illustration and the Persian illustrations that were available. So the artists could introduce the techniques in their own practices. We have to understand the political changes that happen before the advent of the Mughals. The regional identity somehow started gaining ground, especially in case of art and culture. The period of 15th century saw the weakening of Delhi Sultanate and the rise of the regional powers. With the regional powers rising, we have regional languages gaining importance and languages set the whole mood for writing books. And the illustrated books somehow gained importance among the gentry and the upper class traders. The cultural ethos of the political zones had therefore a very strong local cultural fervor as a result of which regional languages, local art architecture flourished with the rubric of the greater Islamic aesthetics adding on to the Indian cultural fervor. Now moving on to the section of secular folk and religious style of 15th and 16th century. We have to understand that this is a big group of painting illustrations which has to be called uh, as the secular folk form because they really don't conform to any particular group and the paucity of the sources does not entitle this group to be given a name altogether. The secular folk religious manuscripts of 15th and 16th century completely changed the painting styles of India. The Jaina painting style as we have discussed in other modules brought some minor adjustments in the conservative format. A small group of Hindu painters also called the early introducing the early Rajput style brought about some significant change and became the marker of this period. The main problem of this group of painting is the date and the provenance. Neither the illustrations have dates or the provenance of the group. So the evolution of this group is very difficult to ascertain. But it of course was in the line of the continuity of wall painting. Do, uh, we do understand the, that the history of wall painting goes back to ancient India and it definitely continued in the time of the medieval period. But of course we have very very little examples left. 
The traces are of course found in certain palaces of Gwalia Chittor and Fatipur Sikri, but of course we cannot name them within this group. The provenance of this group of painting was very large. It started as we have discussed in Gujarat, moved to Delhi, Jaunpur, Mandu, Gwalior and then to Mewar. We have to understand that all these areas were popular for the regional culture of this period which is essentially medieval. Obviously, the Mughal atelier which came later used the skill of the artist later. We let's start with the first group of painting style, the Chaurapanchashika. Chaurapanchashika style was also used by the early Mughals. The profile of Champavati, it, the square face, pointed chin and huge eyes became the marker of this painting style. The free-flowing orni was something very new and very unique to South Asia. It was not found in the Persian painting skills. The N.C. Mehta collection at Ahmedabad has the Chaurapanchashika after which the whole group has been named and it is one of the remarkable collection of paintings of 22 illustrations that has survived. The repetitive nature of this text was responsible for its restricted composition. We have to understand that this is one of the most problematic areas of the painting styles not only of this genre but also of the other genres of medieval period. So it had to follow a very very strict iconographic feature and it gave little scope to the artist to move beyond this iconography. This was a manuscript which saw technical revolution because here the full profile was turned and the characters conversed with each other. Now this is something that was also absent in the Persian style. So some scholars do opine that the concept of movement actually was started in the Indian subcontinent with this kind of uh, illustrations and during this period. The erotic aesthetic mood of the lovers portrayed as Bilhan and Champavati was also able to depict in this illustration which was very new to the cultural ethos of the illustrations. The fine lines define the silhouetted body and the strict profile which is the marked feature of this illustration type. Chaurapanchashika therefore became the landmark of the period and all the contemporary manuscripts came to be compared by the scholars with this manuscript. The style did not definitely evolve in a day. There are other manuscripts also from Polya which has the same trends but it is very difficult to ascertain these manuscripts and link it to Chaurapanchashika. So therefore we have to understand that Gwalior remains a very important area to be named as one of the originators of Chaurapanchashika. Of course till date there has been no evidence to prove so. The next uh, illustration or manuscript that is very important in this genre is the Aranyaka Parvan. We have to understand this is the only manuscript which is dated. Now this Aranyaka Parvan is, is an illustrated uh, manuscript of one chapter of Mahabharata and it is preserved in the Asiatic Society of Bombay uh, and it is written in the Pothi format with full colophon. Now it was copied by someone named Bhavani Das who is a Kayasthu caste and lived somewhere in Bengal for a Vaishnava patron Bhan Das Chaudhary or Chandrapuri in 1516. So therefore this information gives us an idea that there were professional artists who moved from one place to the other and they also worked for patrons who spoke different languages. Moti Chandra and Khandalavala identified the region very close to the river Jamuna this time with this manuscript. The manuscript was prepared during the time of the Lodi rule which stretched from Delhi to Jaunpur. 
The manuscript used Jaina symbols, red medallion in verso margins along with other Jaina formats. And we have discussed in the other module of which deals with Jaina uh, miniatures, we have understood that the Jaina iconography was copied by the genres of the contemporary India. The style of the miniatures was in close proximity to the Chaurapanchashika group, though the whole format was not the same. The draftsmanship was very weak and the composition was not done for any royal patron because the use of colors were very cheap and very, very moderately uh, used color, uh, expensive colors were dealt in this illustration. The next in this group comes the Mrigavat. The reason why Mrigavat has been chosen to be uh, tallied with this group is because it actually tries to be a kind of a joinder of the Charapanchashika group and the Aranyaka Parvan. It is illustrated uh, manuscript of a prose composed by Sheikh Kudban and it was originally had some 253 illustrations in Kaithi script. This manuscript is preserved in the Bharat Kala Bhavan uh, Benares Hindu University. Originally, the illustration was done along the text, so no colophon was found. The illustrations were full page and approximately sized about 15 by 15. Now, this information is important because to understand that the artists were now in a position to work with moderate amount of motion, moderate amount of interesting intricacies and information within a very, very limited area. We have to understand that the Pothi style did not give much space, even if the manuscript was illustrated on paper. The manuscript should have been done between 1525 to 1570, a period when Chaura Panchashika group and the Jaino miniatures style or the Western Indian style was already at its peak. It was a folk romance of Jaunpur and it hinted at the Sharki literary activity of Jaunpur. So therefore, the regional identity of Jaunpur or the literary identity of Jaunpur has come out in this illustrated manuscript, which actually was, in, actually was using a kind of genre of painting already developed, let's say, about 60 or 70 years back. If the folk aspect of the manuscript be kept aside, then it could be claimed that the manuscript essentially imbibed most of the characteristics of the Charpanchashika style, including the depiction of landscape. The layout of the pages was in close proximity to Aranyak Parvan of 1516. And we also have to understand the text of here was in the verso. And the layout of the paintings was done in a way where night and day could be segregated. The illustrations and the writing of the text was perhaps done by the same member of the family, again signifying the fact that now you had professionals who would deal in calligraphy separately and who would deal in illustrations separately. The illustration has a strong folk flavor and was definitely done for an upper class patron and not for anyone from the royal family because the amount of money spent on these illustrations was not much. The male and female figures had close proximity with the figures of Aranyak Parvan. So therefore, at least signifying the fact that the Chaura Panchashika style developed in a way that it could be imbibed into any kind of storyline that was being illustrated at that point of time. This manuscript was also a very important social document. The depiction of the figures and their dress code strictly followed the class composition of the type. So therefore, now any illustrations was actually uh, becoming a kind of a source of social history, which could now then designate uh, the position of the characters by just depiction of the color of the skin.
So this is something very unique that already started before the advent of the Mughals. Now next to this group which is very important is Chandayana. The Awadhi manuscript of Chandayana in Lahore and Chandigarh Museum belong to this group. Now this is one manuscript which is now not in a puthi format that is the horizontal format but in a vertical codex format of Islamic books or Quran of that time in and it is written in Awadhi but in a Naksky uh, script in black between 1525 and 1550. So this kind of a variation could also be used now where the genre remained the same, the iconographic features remained the same. Instead of the Pothi style, we were now seeing uh, illustrations in the codex format of the uh, group of Persian schooled uh, illustrations like the Persian illustrations and in a Naski strip. Uh, it belonged to of course the Chaurapanchashika group again depicting the social life and again the size of the text is 23 by 15 centimeters therefore it had a longer format. The illustrations were able to keep intact the Sufi culture of simplistic relation between God and man and the world in the form of the erotic desires. We have to understand that now was a time when the artist was able to relate to the story of the narrator in not only by depicting the characters but by introducing emotions in the format of the illustrations. The manuscript was an important evidence of Hindu Muslim society and its composite culture. Keeping to the format of the time, the illustrations depicted the male figure in a kulhadar turban or what we called a raised turban which was also found during the time of Humayun, Jamas, Patkas but the ethos remained essentially Hindu. The women were necessarily dressed in the Hindu format of Ghagra and Orni, again a transparent one. This manuscript was perhaps commissioned by a Muslim patron and executed by a Hindu painter. Of course, the provenance is very difficult to envisage today. Strong flat colors were used for the background. The division of the picture surface into neat rectangle panels the register was very unique and superbly controlled. So therefore, it has moved beyond the time of Aranyak Parvan or perhaps even Brigavat. This was something very clear and neatly laid out. The Laurachanda has one figure very interesting, a grey beard, short turban worn, flat turban raised kulha uh, who sits and reads an Arabic book on a low rehal. The word Allah is interestingly visible in all the illustrations. He may be Mullah Daud. It is the gratitude of the painter to the poet. This is a very, very for a common format of Arunak Parvan. He shares space with the listener. So it is like a listener is actually being narrated by the poet himself. Last of the group, uh, the way of, the, uh, of this group, the important uh, uh, manuscript is Bhagavad Puran. Bhagavad Puran is a very, very noteworthy, important manuscript because it stretches the line of this genre. The manuscript was possibly painted in a workshop because we find number of painters and their hands being used in this illustration and all the illustrations of course is not of the same time. It is the earliest surviving illustrations of the life of Krishna according to the 10th book of Bhagavad Puran. It belonged to the Charapanchashika group again and it is also said to be the predecessor of the Rajput style of Mewar. It paved the way for the iconography of the late Bhagavata manuscript series. The text of course here is in chaste 
uh, Sanskrit. So therefore, we have to understand that the patron was essentially Hindu. The conventional style of Chaura Panchashika is found everywhere in the text. The loyal patronage may not be the case for the, this Purana, but it was definitely illustrated in a workshop of artists. Robert Skelton firmly says that this was illustrated in a place like Mathura. Of course, Andrew Topsville is of opinion that it was illustrated in Mewar. Now, these two facts have been mentioned because there has uh, we have to understand that the provenance of these illustrations is very difficult to ascertain. But of course, the time was definitely mid 16th century and maybe a much later time. Gita Govinda is the other illustrated manuscript or in this group which has been preserved in the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrahala in Mumbai and survived with about a dozens of illustration. The figural style was a bit different here. The landscape here is very interesting. It has been treated with much care. Uh, of course, again, this manuscript is also in Sanskrit and has a very close proximity with Chaurapanchashika, but has a very, very peculiar folk element. The figures distinctly portray the mood of the characters and the illustrations had certain movement, which is very unique. This manuscript, of course, has a very strict proximity with the early paintings of Mewar. The importance of these manuscripts lay in the fact that before and during the advent of the Mughals, the manuscripts proved that the Indian scenario had changed from its past archaic practices and was moving rapidly towards grasping reality in the form of movement, emotion and depiction of flora and fauna. Now we move on to the Next section, the Sultanate painting. Again, this is a group of conglomerated uh, painting styles of uh, this period. Now, for the convenience of the expression, Sultanate painting as a term refers to the paintings that have been done for the Muslims in India prior to the uh, Mughals and sometimes in the Muslim courts. They appear as a regional offshoot, otherwise unimportant in the context of Persian painting, but in the context of India, it has tremendous importance. They can never be called a group of Persian paintings, but of course, they can be called as a group which developed in India and formed a kind of a genre or a mixed genre as such. Now, it is actually a conglomeration of three groups, as uh, J.P. Losty has said. The first group is in the basic Iranian style. The earlier version of this group belonged to the mid-15th and a Persian classics in provincial Timurid style. The second type is the group that is Indian character has characteristics and securely linked to Mandu, Bengal and Golconda. The second group does not belong to any group, but essentially done for other patrons. They exhibit the Inju and the Mamluk style as well as the medieval Indian characteristic. They date from mid 15th century, but of course we cannot tell that all the characteristics of the Inju's, Mamluks or Indian as was there. The third group belonged to the 16th century or we can say late 16th century. The two manuscripts of Chandayana belong to this group. Persian and Indian forms were well synthesized in this group. The first group of Indian Sultanate painting was essentially very simple in its look. These 15th century paintings did not have any provenance and therefore adds much to the con uh, confusion and as to who actually patronized this group. The manuscript of this type belonged to the period between say 1420 to 1450. Delhi failed to prove its provenance and the provincial sultans belonged to much later period. So here lies the confusion as to who perhaps patronized this style apart from the court. In the 1531 Sharafnama of Bengal has stylistic similarity with the 15th century Primitimurid style with Mongol archaism. This at least proved that Bengal in the 16th century had some kind of a Timurid school. 
The color composition also do not follow the Timurid norm, but rather has a dramatic appeal and kind of a reminder of the Rajasthani paintings. Certain furnitures, accessories, landscapes and architecture do not have any Persian counterpart. Sometimes Persian imitations were done inappropriately. Sometimes Persians were uh, uh, forms were betrayed with peculiar angularity like the Jain miniatures. So therefore these were done by Indians who had an idea about other genre. The Berlin Hamza Nama had this peculiar carpet-like decorative band which was not a Persian norm and definitely a style imbibed by the Western Indian painting format of the 15th and the 16th century. Now here, Mandu was one of the leading centers of these type of manuscript illustrations evident from the four manuscripts available from this area. Mandu manuscripts of late 15th century and early 16th century gives a clear picture of the scenario of Muslim royal patronage to art in the provinces. Essentially, they were not all very royal. The new style of Turkoman and Shiraz is evident from the manuscript of this period, proving that the artist must have moved from these places to Mandu because of the need of work. The first is a lectionary with 179 miniatures in the Turkman style of Shiraz done by an artist from Mantu probably in 1490 to 1500. This is called the Mithaul Fuzala. Now the next which is very important manuscript but of course has a uh, royal lineage is the Nimatnama. Nimatnama is a cookery book at the British Museum belonging to the early 16th century proved that the Persian artist used his own hand along with two Indian artists to illustrate this book. Because in this illustration format, we have three hands of artists illustrating together in the same book. It was devoted to the cooking in the reign of Ghyat al-Din Khalji's son Nasir al-Din Shah Khalji. It was written in simple Persian prose with Prakrit names of for dishes and their ingredients. Now this can be called as the first cookery book of medieval India. The royal copy was written in large bold naski. Nimatnama was done on a basis of simple Turkman form available as it suited the Indian artists living in this remote area from Persia. We have to understand in all the illustrations the king appears in the middle and with a raised moustache can be attached to the royal name. Of the two artists, the second somewhat was inferior to the earth. The first artist definitely had more efficiency in Turkman style and could have been from Persia. The second artist could have been indigenous artist who was trained by the first artist. So he was perhaps the first artist was recruited by the family of Indian artists living in Mandu. The second artist was less conversant in Persian style and certain difficulty in grasping the Persian format which makes this illustrations very interesting. The work was disarranged true. The work was brought in completion during the time of Nasir al-Din Shah Khalji and could therefore be dated to say let's about 1495 to 1505. The next work is the Busta of Saadi, which is a collection of poems by Saadi. Now, it is preserved in the National Museum of New Delhi. The Busta of Saadi of 1500 to 1502 at the National Museum is in Herati style and in fine Nastalik and also used two artists for its illustration. The name of the painters appears in the first folio verso as Haji Mahmud. The colophon at the end mentioned the scribes as Shah Suwar. So we can understand from the names that they must have had some kind of Persian connection. 43 miniatures in total is there in this complete manuscript. It was a simple in its look and they reminded the style practiced in the late 15th and early 16th century Herat. The actions were less expressive, though the approach was realistic.
Compared to the Persian prototype, the landscape and architecture had less scope. So therefore, this is where it actually deviates from the Persian mood. The features give the manuscript a provincial appearance. This limited approach was perhaps the limitation of the artist himself and not because of uh, the artist who lived in Mandu. The fourth and the last is the Ajaibul Sanai. Now this is a, a piece which has been copied wrongly. It is the last of the four manuscripts. It's a Persian translation of Arabic automata and it gives the origin of the Deccani style. All these four manuscripts prove that Mandu was recently exposed to illustrations of Persia and it was appreciated as an art form and imbibed the tradition in its own way. It also can uh, say that it had some kind of a trade relation with the Persian land. In this section, will remain incomplete if we do not talk about the Jainish Shahnama. This uh, illustration uh, set was uh, actually found out by B. N. Goswami in 1966. The manuscript was probably done in the middle of the 15th century. The name of the painter or provenance of it is, is not known. There are 66 in number and in horizontal format. The painting stretched over the whole page. The text is four columns and was only part of it. The painter thus was still thinking in the format of Pothi of Western India, which was very popular in contemporary India. This is a Jainist work and not a painting done by a professional uh, painter for a Muslim painter who incorporated certain Indian elements with which he was familiar. It is a, like a bridge work that raised questions wholly relevant to the disparity that existed between the style and the subject matter. The style was essentially Jain, but the subject matter was foreign. So it can be said that indigenous styles became so independent that it could depict any subject with ease and elan. The next section, uh, we discuss the Sharif Nama, uh, which was uh, illustrated in 1531, which came from Bengal in Shirazi style with Mongol type of rocks of the previous century and marks the end of a style that evolved in Bengal before the advent of the Mughals. The poem never developed in a, as an independent school but remains as an offshoot of the Persian school. Sharafnama was patronized by Sultan of Gore, Sultan Usrit Shah. Sharafnama was the first part of the 12th century epic of Sukhandar Nama written by Mizami Ganjvi and written in four column Naski in Persian and contains about 78 pages. The illustrations were perhaps done by three artists because we can distinctly count the hands of three artists. The first artist again was the most brilliant work compared to the first two illustrations. The fifth was done by the second artist. Rest of the illustrations had been done by the third artist who definitely lacked the liveliness of the first two artists. The last illustration was to some extent incomplete and gold has been used profusely because it is a royal investment. The work also gave an idea about the architecture of gold which is very important as a social account. The illustrated copy of Sharaf Nama spoke loads about the art activity of gore at that point of time. The elite class was aware of the Persian painting and was definitely aware that what was available in the market and the patrons who invested wanted a copy very close to its Persian counterpart. It must have been done by artist community who catered to the needs of these patrons and it cannot be one single group of artists, but perhaps many artists lived in Gore at that point of time to cater to these kind of patrons. The second group of painting, which was also termed as a bourgeoisie painting group, was a crude version of the Persian format of horizontal viewpoint. In this group fall the dispert Amir Khasru manuscript, the Berlin Hamza Nama, and the Law Sikandar Nama, and the Berlin Chandayan. 
The first manuscript though was different from the rest. It had a very strong Mamluk connection and very little or no Indian style. The script was in Nastalik and the manuscript could belong to the mid 15th century. The other three manuscripts of this period had strong connection with the Jaina painting style discussed in the earlier modules. The third group of Sultanate painting comprises the two Chandayanas at the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrale, Mumbai and at the John Rylands Library, Manchester. Both were able to incorporate the independent Jaina Iranian Hindu and the Sultanate style together. The synchronization of the elements was perhaps the real achievement of this group and especially the 16th century India before the establishment of the Mughal studio. The time gap between the former and the last was about a quarter and a century. Uh, there were several styles of Chandayana illustrations ranging from the primitive Chandayana, Jain style to the sophisticated style of the Muslim court as revealed in the Ryland and Mumbai manuscripts respectively to that of the Hindu style as revealed in the Lahore Chand Chandigarh manuscript discussed earlier. All the styles could not have been originated in Jaunpur, the original land where Chandayan was written in Awadhi. So therefore Chandayan had a North Indian importance and the illustrations were done in different parts of North India. Coming to an end, we have to understand that the Mumbai Chandayana had much similarity in color, a combination with the Nimath Nama from Mandu and thus it could be linked to Mandu again in the period between 1520 and 1530. So therefore we have to understand that Mandu produced a number of types of illustration of this period and it depended on the taste of the patron. The Berlin manuscript belonged to a later period when Mandu was ruled by Baz Bahadur and the last independent ruler of uh, Mandu before its fall in 1561. Thus this style did not spread like the earlier one. In the Hamza Nama at Berlin, the depiction of men in three-quarter profile was very similar to the Shahi figure of the Jaina Kalpa Sutra discussed earlier. So therefore, the third group actually tried to incorporate all the styles together and present it to its patron. While summarizing this module, we have to understand this, this module tried to give you an idea as how lack of information regarding the provenance and date of the above mentioned manuscripts creates a confusion and chronological distortion of the study of the manuscripts. The purpose of mentioning these manuscripts and to some extent analyzing them was to understand and grasp the scenario of the indigenous practices of painting in the land where the Mughals skillfully had built up their atelier. The concept of wandering artists in search of work or rich patrons appreciating art therefore was not a new trend in India and it this provided the space for the artists when the Mughals came. With discussion of this module, I hope that we have understood how the scenario of the indigenous painting schools could have evolved and how this paved the way for the new road to the Mughal understanding of the Mughal school. We have to understand that it is this group of paintings and artists who then joined the Mughal atelier which was in its waiting for its full bloom. For further understanding of the subject, please uh, go to the website of EPG Patshala and the text adjoined to it. Thank you.